you know their whatever. You know this, just the sound of how they live and sleep and function. That's how deeply God knows you. God knows the sound of your voice. I know my own and my own know me. And everyone has a voice and that is your own imprint on this world, your own DNA and your own character. And the idea that everyone has their voice, there's not just one voice that you're all looking for. You know, emotionally, in terms of the world, in terms of how you think, in terms of how you see, but you all belong to Christ and you find that voice that is distinctly you. And when you found that voice, learn how to use it. Learn how to stand up for something. Learn how to be something. Get out there and be somebody. Do something. That's part of your life. You have, you have that gift. And it's not given to you for just a casual gift. You have your own personality and you have your own journey. Claim it and own it and celebrate it. Sometimes we go through life thinking it's somebody else's gift or we've not been dealt the right hand or dealt enough cards. You've been dealt plenty. You have it. It's your character and your life. In Psalm 23, as you walk through the text a little bit, the psalmist says, He restores my soul. The Good Shepherd restores my soul. And my first thought is, well, why do you need restoring? Isn't your soul always vital and strong? I rode my motorcycle to church last night, but I had to push start it <clears throat> to get it going. And being a manual transmission, how many of you know about push starting cars? You know how that works. You know, if you have a manual car, and if you've got a weak battery, park on the downhill, you know, because you'll always be able to find a way to get it started or most often and it's the same way with a motorcycle because no matter what you do you put a motorcycle in the garage over the winter and if you don't tend to the battery it's going to be a little weak in the spring that's just the way it is sometimes our soul is depleted we're just tired we're weary we can handle so many things so many losses so many struggles and then we need something that brings us back, back to life, back to energy. <clears throat> People look at this weather and go, it's the weather, it's the sun, it's the life. But your own soul, that's why we gather week after week and we sing and we pray and we share the word and we have a good time together. We call that a good time. It's a great time. And we're able to share some of the best of what we know in life because we know it fills and strengthens our soul again. It gets the voltage up again. And every one of you has got your own field of energy. Scientists tell us that people have tremendous power when you think about all the atoms in your body and all the capacities that you have, the muscles, the capacities to heal and think and organize. And that energy, that energy... When we're depleted, we just know we, we need we're more, more fully alive when we are rested and we are spiritually tended and when our soul is restored. He says, though we walk through the darkest valley, and in some translations, as though I walk through the valley of the, what? Shadow of death. Yeah, that one sticks with you because it's so poetic. And maybe the darkest valley is a little better translation, but... The valley of the shadow of death just sticks in my mind. What's that all about? Right at the beginning of a celebration psalm, it's though we walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, the joy and power and blessings of Christ are not given to people who've learned how to insulate themselves in life. They're given to people who are in the midst of life with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, with all that it brings. Some people have a vision of church that it's the place where you go and cocoon and you separate yourself from the world and from all of the pain of the world and from all of the things that have gone wrong in the world and from all the things that are broken within me, myself, and we come and pretend like everything's right. But you can do that. You can come and pretend long enough, and pretty soon 
you don't feel authentic. Pretty soon you feel like you're running from something. And pretty soon your religion turns into this collective delusion about life and what it is and who we belong to. True joy and faith is given in the midst of the suffering of life. And there isn't a week that goes by and I don't hear of something tragic or at least sad happening to somebody in this congregation, someone in my family, someone in my history. It's just life. You're always having something coming unglued. You're often having something good happen too that picks you up, but you also realize nobody gets out of life without being bruised and bumped and grieving and troubled. And everyone is grieving something. Everybody is broken and grieving something. It may be a person in your life. It may be someone you didn't know meant that much to you, but their absence creates a sense of emptiness or sadness in your life. It may be somebody you counted on immensely. It may be a relationship that broke. It may be a, a person in your life that has kind of faded or been ignored and you wonder where that is. It may be a job or a career that transformed into something else or morphed, but you miss the old style of it. It happens all the time. Life doesn't stand still, and so the darkest valley is just the valley where we live, knowing that we live in the shadow of things that are broken, and even in the valley of the shadow of death. We don't live in the reality of death, but we live in its shadow all the time. We're aware of where it's at and where we are at. We celebrate our birthdays and our life, but we know we know that there is something real about the fact that we get so much time on this earth. And if we recognize that, we can do two things. Either run from that reality or we can find the deepest joy and strength in the midst of it that helps us to live as fully and completely as we possibly can. And that's what life in Christ is. And that's what the good life is. And that's what we're seeking is that good life. You know, we want God to pour that into us and be able to live that. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort you. Well, <clears throat> last time I looked, the staff that shepherds use isn't just comforting. It isn't fuzzy and soft. It's, it's meant to be a hook. And you can pull and cajole and block the way for the sheep and guide them. But sometimes... God's guidance in our life and sometimes God's work in our life is blocking one path and opening another and showing us where to go and none of us get around without being bumped a little bit by God too. Sometimes we call it awakening. Sometimes it's just a deep aw awakening where we wake up to some reality about who we are or what we need to be doing. But that is part of the walk and that's part of the faith journey. You prepare a table in the presence of mine enemies my enemies. Who wants to eat a banquet in the presence of your enemies? Wouldn't you be a little self-conscious or nervous or troubled? Does the lion like to eat his fare in the shadow of all the hyenas, you know, circling around? Is that what I want to eat, you know, celebrate the banquet with all the hyenas around? But then I realize, too, if you can't celebrate in the midst of things that are broken and troubling and disturbing, you'll never celebrate in life. You just won't. If you learn to celebrate in the midst of the brokenness and know what is strong and what is gift and what holds you, then there's no circumstance that destroys you. What if we said we're not going to have church except on a week when nobody has lost anything? Would we ever worship? Or where nobody has had something bad happen to them? Or we're going to comb the paper, and if the Saturday, Sunday morning paper, we're not going to have church as if there's bad news going on. It's just, it's a nothing but good news we're going to have. We're not celebrating our delusions and illusions about life. We celebrate the presence of Christ in the brokenness of a world that is always breaking in on people. It's always disturbing them. It's always grieving us. And our strength is just knowing who walks with us. Our strength is knowing who walks with us. 
You anoint me with oil, my cup overflows. You have to anoint somebody pretty heavily before the cup overflows with oil. And you realize it's God pouring into each one of us exactly what we need for this life, for the challenges that lay ahead. That God's already given you what you need. God has already given you the gifts and the intelligence and the talents. You can't sit back and say, God, I wish you'd blessed me like so-and-so, and then I'd really have a purpose in this world. You have what you need. And in whatever occupation you are in or whatever service you're doing, you still have a path of living out the faith with integrity and with authenticity and with courage, the life that you've been called to. It's there for you, and God has already equipped you and overflowed into your life. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me the, the days of my life. And it isn't that only good things will happen, but goodness and mercy is what surrounds people in the midst of the brokenness of life. And when you have that, nobody can take it away. It belongs to you. Revelation is an image of life brought together by the presence of God at the end of times. And it's almost like if people had lived the fullness of this promise and they figured out how to live the fullness of this promise, whether they knew the name of Christ or not, whether they knew the name, whether they knew what it meant to be a Lutheran, whether they recognized, excuse me, how specific that is, it's an image of all nations and all peoples and all languages gathered before a God and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb and learning to live in the mercy and love of God towards each other. And you realize whether people specifically find the path that brings them on the same path you are on, we are all part of this cosmic grace of God trying to mend this entire world. Some say it's a naive vision that we ought to be satisfied to just be a little tribal faith and say we're just the Lutheran tribe or the Christian tribe in the midst of so many tribes. But there is this overarching promise that somehow God, in the character of what we understand there to be Christ, is trying to gather this whole world together. And we are participating in it in ways that we don't fully understand or even see the big picture. Revelation is about that big picture, people of every nation. And you realize not every nation knew the name of Yahweh. And we know that somehow in that picture, people will come to understand, even if they don't peg it to exactly the same story. And I think that's part of the beauty of it, that we can look at this world and see how God is healing it. Us knowing that we are baptized into Christ, and we own that journey, and we live it as fully and as committed as we know how, and we know God has a plan for this universe that is about the cosmic Christ. It is about the biggest picture of healing and mending that you can imagine. So each week, week after week, we receive the body and blood of Christ, knowing God makes us whole, but that now we're being broken open for the healing and the mending of this whole world. And that becomes our new vocation. You know, that really becomes our new job. That's laid in there with the character of how we live. Lord God, we know our story of Jesus. And we cherish it deeply, but we know the power of the healing of Jesus is even bigger than the story. And that the cosmic Christ, that your ultimate aim in this world is to restore all of humanity to the original purpose of harmony and strength and grace. Help us to live it fully and powerfully in this place. Help us to break it open into our lives and trust it in our vocations. And help us to live toward the promise and the day when all will be made one. Where languages will be no barrier, where skin color, where nationality, 
but where all people are washed in the blood of the Lamb and resonate with the promise of His grace. In your holy name.